Welcome back to McMaster University course Computing and Software 701 Logic and Discrete Mathematics. We have been discussing the topic of basic mathematical concepts. Last time we started a survey of various kinds of mathematical values and the first value we looked at were numbers. Today we're going to look at sets, sequences, and relations. Now a set is just a collection of objects. And a set can be a member of a set. And this is what gives sets a lot of power. Sets can include sets as members. Now some collections of objects cannot be sets. And the best example of this is the Russell set, which I'm going to define right now. So we can define the Russell set R as a set of all sets such that that set is not a member of itself. Now, you may say, well, this doesn't really make sense. You may say sets can't contain themselves. Well, you may, if you, even if you say that, this still makes sense because that would mean that every set would be a member of the Russell set because every set does not contain itself. Or you could say, well, sets could contain themselves. So one way or another, this definition seems to make, make some sense. So let's ask the obvious question. Does the Russell set contain itself? Let's say this is true. Let's say, let's just assume R is a member of R. And what does that imply? Well, if we look up here, if R is a member of R, it's a member of this set. And this implies that R is not a member of R. So if R is a member of R, R must not be a member of R. Okay, so let's suppose that R is not a member of R. If R is not a member of R, this is true. So, so R will be a member of this set, and that implies that R is a member of R. So we basically have just shown that R is a member of R if and only if R is not a member of R. So, so logically, uh, this doesn't seem to make any sense. And this is why we call it the Russell set. And this is also called the Russell paradox. So the way to avoid the Russell paradox is not to allow collections to be too large and be sets. So we say a collection that is too large to be a set is a proper class. So we don't really want to call it the Russell set. We want to call it the Russell class. And you would say, well, how does this prevent the paradox? Well, a class, a proper class, is not allowed to be a member of a set or a class. So only, only sets can be members of classes. Classes are collections that are so big they can't be members of themselves. Now there's different styles of set theory. Uh, the first one is what we could call naive set theory. We don't really worry too much about exactly what sets are. The problem that, with that is we can write down something like the Russell set. Uh, we can have uh, styles of set theory where we have a universal set. All the members that we ever use are all part of one big set. Uh, We can be very formal and have set theories where we avoid paradoxes like the Russell set. The most famous of these is ZF set theory, ZF set theory, which is called zermelo frankel set theory. But there's no universal set here. There's no universal uh, set that we can actually refer to that includes all members. There's another set called MBG set theory, which stands for 
von Neumann Bernays Gödel set theory. This set theory is very similar to ZF set theory, but it uh, does have a universal class. So these are very popular set theories. Another kind of set theory that is popular is growth and deke, a set having growth and deke universe, universes like TG set theory, which is Tarski growth and deke set theory. In this set theory, we can have sets which basically are models of set theory themselves. So in that one set, we can have all the operations we normally would have in set theory. And there's there's other there are other um, formal set theories as well. So let me erase these things. So that's a pretty quick overview of what sets are. There's lots of different set concepts. I'm sure most of these will be familiar to you. So like with membership, we can say that something is a member of a set. Uh, little a is a member of a set big A. We can have the subset relation that says that all members of A are members of B and we can have cardinality. That's a way of assigning a size to a set. We'll talk about that more later. We have basic operations like, like union, intersection, complement, difference, and symmetric difference. Uh, those should be familiar to you. We have Cartesian product. Cartesian product, let's say, of two sets A and B is going to be the set of ordered pairs little a b, where little a is a member of big A and little b is a member of big B. So that's a Cartesian product. If we talk about a disjoint um, sum, that's a way of basically taking the union of A and B, but we want to make sure we can separate members, a member that's a, a value that's in both A and B. So there's different ways you can do this. We can say that this, we can tag these, let's say with zero and one like this. And then we have the similar thing here. I'm running out of room. We could tag the Bs. This is something like that. So this would be the disjoint union. Let's, let's erase some of this stuff. We also have the sum set. Basically, the sum set is the union of all the members of the set. And we have the power set. So we have the sum set here. That's the union of all its members. And we have the power set. That's a set of its subsets. We can have very various special sets. Of course, there's the empty set, the set that contains no members at all. I already talked about universal sets. In some situations, we could have a set that contains all the members that we can talk about. We just talked about ordered pairs. Um, we're going to talk about sequences, relations, functions. We've all we've talked about ordinals previously, and cardinals. Cardinals are ordinals that we use to measure the size of sets. We'll talk about that later. Now, relations and functions can be represented as special kinds of sets. These are sets of tuples. And in a moment, we're going to talk about what tuples are. To get to that, we have to talk about sequences. Now, there's there's many ways of defining a sequence. I didn't write it here, but I could say a sequence is just an enumeration. I just enumerate some values. And that enumeration could be infinite. It could be finite. And it's important that it, in the enumeration, I can repeat values. 
So A1 and A2 could be the same value. So that's one way of defining a sequence. A little more formal way is to say that a sequence is an ordered multiset. Now, a multiset is just a set where you allow members to occur more than once. So a value could be a member of a multiset a number of times. And then an order multiset is one that's ordered in a linear way. These ordered multisets are also called, or a multiset are also called a bag. Um, now we can, we can also think of a set as a certain kind of function, as a mapping from the initial set of natural numbers to the set. So I could write like this. We have some natural numbers. That's initial set. And this gets mapped to, let's say, A1. This gets mapped to A2. And this gets mapped to A3, and so forth. And we can think of, of the sequence as either being a function with finite domain, like this one has four members in its domain, or it could have infinite domain. But it's, it's a mapping of an initial sequence, initial segment of the natural numbers. So I said sequences can be either finite or infinite in mathematics sequences are very often infinite in computing. They're much more likely to be finite. And there's different ways of writing a finite sequence. It could be written just like this. It could be written with parentheses around it, or angle brackets, or square brackets. These are all different ways. There's other ways as well. Uh, since sequences are so common, there's many ways to write them. Now, we use finite sequences in many ways in mathematics and computing, and three very popular ways of using them in computing are as a tuple. A tuple is a finite sequence, which we write like this. Notice it has parentheses around it. And we imagine that the values could be of different kinds. They don't have to be of the same kind. Uh, but Often in computing, if we're imagining that we have a finite sequence where the members are of the same kind, or like in a programming language, they have the same type, this is written like this. We use square brackets. And sometimes we want to talk about finite sequences of characters. These are called strings, and these are written like this. Okay, so. Sequences are very important. We use them in lots of ways. We have different notation for them. We can think of them as, like I said, already multi-sets. Think of them as enumerations. We can think of them as certain kinds of functions. So what is a re relation? A relation is really just a special kind of set. Um, We'll say that an n-ary relation is a set, is a subset of a Cartesian product. Now, I, I defined just a moment ago a binary Cartesian product. You can define them the same way. So the members of this, this um, uh, Cartesian product are going to look like, they're, well, they're going to be tuples, like this. Oops, sorry. Each member is going to look like this, and this is going to be little one, A1 will be a member of big A1, and so forth. And so a relation is just a set of these tuples. That's all a relation is. And we call it a relation because these tuples, each tuple says how, in this case, n members are related to each other. And here you can see that n is greater than or equal to 1. So we could have unary relations, but a unary relation is basically just a set. Um, so a non, 
A non-unary relation can always be considered as a binary relation. So you may ask, well, how is that possible? So let's say I have a three area relation. I can think of that as this kind of relation, which is binary, or I could think of it this way as binary. So this, this, and this are three different relations, but they essentially can be used the same way. Okay, so, so relations are very fundamental. They're used in all different kinds of ways. Uh, of course, they're very fundamental to both mathematics and computing. And we can represent functions we haven't talked yet about functions, but we can represent functions by relations. Functions are just a special kind of relation, and you can think of the relation as being the graph of the function. We'll talk more about that uh, later. We can also think of relations as n-ary predicates. We can represent relations as n-ary predicates. So we're going to talk about functions later, but the basic idea is I could have my relation R, let's say like this, and then I could have an n -ary predicate, which I can think of like this, and that n -ary predicate takes three inputs and gives back an output, which is false or true. And it gives back false exactly when my tuple is in R, and it gives back true. I, it gives back false when my tuple is not in R, and it gives back true when my tuple is in R. So we often think of relations and predicates as interchangeable. We use whatever is most convenient. Okay, so that's what relations are. There's a whole bunch of, of relational concepts. Now, I didn't define what homogeneous was, but homogeneous relations or relations, if we go back up to here and look here, we have A1 through AN. If these are all the same, we say the relation is homogeneous. So in other words, it looks like well, we just have one set here. OK, so that's what homogeneous means. And we have a bunch of, of basic properties for homogeneous, which we'll discuss later. Uh, these properties are being reflexive, irreflexive, symmetric asymmetric, antisymmetric, transitive, total, and trichotomous. Um, now, we also have some other basic binary relation operations. We can come up with the domain of a relation, and we can come up with the range. We can compose relations, inverse. I assume pretty much these are going to be review uh, ideas. Uh, maybe we'll just give one example down here. So if we're going to talk about the domain of a relation, let's say the relation we had, like a, a let's say a, a binary relation. So let's say my relation is I would write this down. It would be all X and A such that there exists a Y in B, such that X, Y is in our relation. So that's what the, that would be an example of domain. Okay, so
So there are various special relations. There is the empty relation. That's the relation which is the empty set. There are no tuples in the set at all. There are uni universal relations. That's a relation in which all possible tuples are in the relation. There's the identity relation. So if I have the identity relation, let's say call it I, and it's a subset, let's see, of A cross A, then I would equal all the tuples of A and A, where A is a member of big A. So that's the identity relation. And then we can have equivalence relations, which we will talk about in just a moment. Now there's there's different ways of representing um, relations. One way is use if we have a binary relation using a zero one matrix. The way this works is I have my zero one matrix. I have up here the different members of let's say the first member. Let's say this is a relation R like this, and up here I have this. And then I put a zero if there's no pair A1, B1. I put a one if there's a pair A1, B1, and so forth. So it's a zero, one matrix. That is one way of representing binary relations. Another way of representing a binary relation, if it's homogeneous, is let's say we have a set A and it has four members. So these are the members of my set A. And I have this relation R on A cross A. And then I can represent it as a graph. I can say that we have the pair A1. We also have the pair A2. And we have the pair A4. We have the pair A4, A4. And we have the pair A3, A2. So if I wrote these out, I would have A1, A2. That's this one. A2, A1. That's this one. A2, A4. That's this one. A4, A4. That's this one, and A3, A2. But you can see that I've represented the relation as a graph, as a, I should say, directed graph. We'll be talking about graphs, but they come later. OK, so let me clean up this mess. So let's move on and let's talk about closures of bi homogeneous binary relations. So a homogeneous binary relation, as we've already said, will look like this. And uh, we can have the reflexive closure. Basically, with the reflexive closure, we want to take R and we want to add to it all tuples of this form. And that will that will create this will be the reflexive closure. In other words, we've thrown all these tuples in and the new relation will be reflexive. Reflexive means, so R is reflexive if we have one of these pairs, AA, for every A in it. Something similar with the symmetric closure. Um, the transitive closure is a little different because the idea of a transitive closure, if we have AB in R, and 
and BC in R. Uh, so if this is true, then we want to put AC in R, in our, I'll call it our R closure. Um, so what does transitive mean? Transitive means if AB is in R and BC is in R, then ACB better be in R. But if AC is not in R, we'll add that to our transitive closure. And we just keep doing this over and over again. We may have to do it an infinite number of steps until we finally get a new relation. So this new relation we'll call the closure of R will have more elements possibly than R, and it will be transitive. Okay, so that's a quick introduction to transitivity. I wish there was a quicker way of, of cleaning these, but I don't know of a convenient way. Okay, now notice that the transitive closure is essentially the same thing as the connectivity relation. So let's, let's uh, say we have a set of numbers. Let's call that set A. And I have a relation like this. Now I just told you we could represent the relation. We can represent the relation by a graph like this. Okay, so there's my graph. Now, the connectivity relation is a relation that's related to R. I'm going to call that RC, RC for connectivity. And that relation is, if I can go from 1 to 2 and 2 to 5, then in my connectivity relation, I can go from 1 to 5, because 1 is connected to 5 by how we can go from 1 to 2, 2 to 3. So we have 1 to 5 we'll have in this relation. We'll also have 1 to 7, and we'll have 1 to 3. And so that's a connectivity relation. That is also the same as a transitive closure. And if we had something like this, the way we make the transitive closure is I would add, I'd add that arrow, and then I would add this arrow, and then I would add this arrow, and since I can go from 6 to 2, I now can go 6 to 5, I can go 6 to 7, so we add up all those arrows, and that will give us the transitive closure. Okay, now there's a very um, important kind of relation which is called an equivalence relation. So equivalence relation is a binary relation that is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. So it's probably a good idea to define these. Let's go back over here. Um, so I'm going to define reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. And We've already touched upon what these mean, but a equivalence relation has all three properties. Okay, so let's say we have E, which is a relation on A cross A. And we're gonna say E is, e is an equivalence relation if E is symmetric 
And by symmetric, that means that um, that means for all actually let's let's not I don't want to do symmetric first. Let's do let's do things in order. Let's say reflexive. That means for all members of A, all members of A, the pair AA is an E. And two, E is symmetric. That means is for all uh, A, B, and A. If this is in E, that implies that the tuple in the opposite order is in E. That's what symmetric means. And three. E is transitive, and that means for all A, B, C, in big A, if A, B, and B, C Both of these are in E. That implies that AC is in E. So if, if A is AB is in E and BC is in AC is in E. So so if we have an equivalence relation, it's going to have to be reflexive, symmetric, and transitive, and any binary relation that's reflexive, symmetric, and transitive is an equivalence relation. Okay, so um, the identity relation is an equivalence relation. Uh, that's, that's pretty easy to say. See, remember, I'll write down right here the identity relation. Looks like this. So it's a member of all pairs AA such little a is in big A. That's identity relation. And it's easy to see that it's reflexive and symmetric and transitive. Um, okay, now one thing that's you always have with an equivalence relation is you have equivalence classes. So if you take any member of a set, um, and then any member of this, well, we have R on a set S. That means that R is a subset of S cross S. If we take any member of S, we can write down this set, the set of all Bs such that A is related to B. By the way, when you have a binary, a binary uh, uh, relation, we could write, with a binary relation, we could write down this, or sometimes we would just write down this. It's an alternate way. Okay, so, so that's what an equivalence class is. It's the set of all values of S that are related to a particular value of S. So we might want to call this something like E, E, C, A. Okay, now what's important about equivalence relations is we have this, this theorem. The theorem says the equivalence relations, relation, the equivalence classes of an equivalence relation on a set formal partition of S. 
So what that means is if I have my set S and I write it like this, here's my set S, it will divide into equivalence classes where each segment here is an equivalence class. And it is a partition. That means that if I take two equivalence classes, their intersection will either be empty or they will be both the same equivalence class. And if I take the union of the, all the equivalence classes, I get all of S. So that's what a partition is. So if you have an equivalence relation, it always determines a, a partition, and the partition will be made up of its equivalence classes. Now if you give me any, part, any partition like this, that will define an equivalence relation. Basically the relation is that things are related exactly if they're in the same member, same member of the partition, and they're not related otherwise. Okay, so that's um, a quick overview of equivalence classes. And we will, I think we'll stop here. Yes, we will start functions in our next video presentation. Okay, so thank you very much, and I will see you later.